So you have decided to pick up nature and wildlife photography. Well, congratulations. You just picked probably the most difficult and most frustrating, yet most rewarding niche of photography that is out there. Now, if you're new to wildlife photography and you're, you're just getting started, you just picked up a camera for the very first time, or you haven't even picked up a camera yet and you're still trying to figure out where to go, this video is for you. We're gonna go step by step, gear, technique, editing, and ethics. We're gonna cover all those bases in this video, so stick around. So what makes nature photography so unique and so different from every other niche or genre of photography? Well, in my opinion, it disconnects you from the world. You know, the, the, all the chaos and all the craziness of life, just for a moment, all of that stress is left behind. Everything else doesn't matter. It's just you and the landscape. It's just you and nature. It's just you and the wildlife. So the very first thing about this hobby and the elephant in the room will be you're going to get sweaty, dirty, cold, and miserable on almost every single outing that you go on. However, it is very, very rewarding. So if that doesn't sound interesting to you, you might want to uh, switch over to wedding photography and have to deal with bridezillas. So in this video, we're going to go over gear, settings, technique, editing, and ethics. So let's just start off with gear. So when it comes to the camera body itself, I'm just gonna say this right now, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what brand you are using or what brand you want to purchase, just jump into a brand, whether it's Canon, Nikon, Sony, Panasonic, most modern cameras today take excellent photos. It really comes down to the lighting, the angle, the composition, and the lens that you currently use, as well as the settings on your camera itself. Now, there are two different types of cameras. There are full-frame cameras, and then there are crop-sensored cameras. Full-frame cameras are just, in a nutshell, it's the equivalent of the original 35 millimeter camera. And then the crop sensor is a smaller, has a smaller sensor, so it's going to give a 1.6 times crop within the image and make it appear as if the subject or the image that you're taking a photo of is actually closer than what it is. There are benefits to both having a crop sensor and having a full frame. Generally, a full frame is gonna be a bigger, have a bigger body, it's gonna be a little bit more expensive, and it's gonna be better in low light conditions. So say, right at sunset, right at sunrise, very cloudy conditions, overcast conditions, that full frame sensor has a bigger sensor, so it's gonna allow more light to come in and uh, be able to have a better overall exposure of your subject. Now with crop sensor bodies, it is a little bit different. Uh, they do have their advantages as well, but they do allow less light into the sensor because it is a smaller sensor. However, you are kind of giving more of an equivalent of an extra 1.6 times crop. So if you're wanting to do far away subjects in wildlife or you're a sports photographer or whatever the case may be, it's going to give you that extra reach a little bit that a full frame camera just won't be able to do. Here's a white egret just chilling, chilling in the water right over here. Now, when it comes to utilizing manual focus or autofocus, generally most modern day cameras are really, really good with autofocus, but it's always good to kind of familiarize yourself with going back to the basics of manual focus and switching over to manual every now and then, um, just because, you know, cameras, you know, the motors go out sometimes and uh, it's always good to know 
to be able to, if you're out getting, you know, either the, the shot of a lifetime or you're just out capturing something unique, you want to be able to focus. And, and if your autofocus is just acting up for whatever reason, you can revert back to manual focus and still be able to get the shot. When it comes to using the shutter button, you don't want to just press really hard on that thing. And you don't want to actually hold your breath you think you might be a little bit more steadier, but it's actually the opposite. Let me explain real quick. So when you're getting ready to shoot and you have your finger halfway pressed on the shutter button, if you're using autofocus and the subject is in frame and you're ready, getting ready to shoot, uh, try not to press so hard or uh, for extended periods of time. What you really want to do is breathe out slowly and then gently squeeze. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. Where you almost don't even realize that you took the shot. What you're honestly doing is you're controlling your breathing and by controlling your breathing, you're allowing less camera shake. When you think you're gonna hold your breath in, you're actually going to have more movement to where you're breathing out, it's slowing the heart rate down and it's allowing you to have more steadier hands unless you drink 10 cups of coffee every day like I do. So. Now there are different camera modes that you can actually shoot in as well. There's manual, there's auto, there's aperture priority. If you're just getting started, I know it's counterintuitive. Most people say, oh, just, just shooting manual all the time, shooting manual, blah, 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 manual or nothing, you know? Yet, yes, I understand manual allows you to uh, adjust on the fly when the conditions aren't right. And, you know, you can get a better and quicker exposure and a correct exposure by using manual when the conditions are not, are, are not ideal. I would rather have you guys be happy and joyful and learning throughout the process and not be so frustrated. So I, I'd encourage you that if you're just getting started, Put the, put the dial on auto, it's the big green A, and uh, uh, at least on Canon, I'm not too sure on Sony or Nikon, but on Canon, it's the big A on the dial here. Basically what auto is gonna do is just allow the camera to make the decision itself as to what it believes is the right exposure for the conditions. So as you do gradually grow as a photographer and you get more familiar with your camera and your camera settings, you know, uh, yes, yes, definitely switch over to manual because like I said, you're able to capture the correct exposure a lot quicker. So if you decide you do want to shoot in manual mode, it all comes down to your settings. Uh, what settings with your ISO, your aperture, and your shutter speed. And this is really gonna be determined on what kind of subjects you're shooting and what the lighting condition is. Well, typically with ISO, you wanna keep your ISO as low as possible. What ISO is is basically the amount of light that is coming into the sensor. And there are situations and circumstances to where you're kind of forced to raise your ISO a little bit more. It's going to allow more light to come in to be able to raise the exposure of your composition, and but it's gonna allow more grain into the photo. Modern software, editing software, is really, really good with fixing this. Uh, so it's really typically not a problem because a lot of modern cameras can handle IS, high ISO, higher ISO fairly well. So now the shutter speed is basically how fast or how slow that shutter comes down over that sensor inside the camera. This is all gonna be determined on what subject you're shooting. So for say landscape, it really doesn't matter because you can have a fast shutter speed or you can have a really slow shutter speed or a really extremely slow shutter speed uh, of say two, three, four, five seconds, 20 seconds, one minute, and it's gonna allow, uh, you know, star trails. You can have star trails doing it that way. You can have that bit butterly, uh, buttery smooth water for like waterfalls. You're slowing down that shutter speed. But when you're shooting wildlife, it really does matter, especially with faster moving subjects. Now with slower moving subjects that are bigger, say bear, elk, moose, those types of wildlife, you can generally get away with having a little bit of a slower shutter speed, say one five hundredth of a second. Bigger birds such as birds of prey, eagles, hawks, owls, those slower moving subjects can handle a little bit of a slower shutter speed because they move slower. Now with smaller birds such as songbirds and waterfowl and ducks, these guys are super, super fast. So you generally want a faster shutter speed, say upwards of one two thousandths of a second or even faster, just because they're so quick. You wanna be able to freeze that action uh, because it happens so fast. And if you have your shutter speed too slow, generally you're gonna have blurry images and you're just gonna get frustrated. I know I have plenty of times. Now with your aperture, generally that has more or less to do with your lens itself rather than the camera body. But all it is is the amount of light that is going into the glass that is hitting the sensor. Now you will hear the term f-stop thrown around quite a bit here in the community. The more and more you do photography. Uh, and basically there'll be a number that is right after that f. 
And that is kind of tricky because the lower the number, the more light comes in, and the higher the f-stop number, the less light comes in. Say you have a lens that uh, is like this one. This is a Sigma 150 to 600, uh, and it has an, a maximum aperture of f6.3. You zoom it back in to 150 millimeters, it becomes an f4.5. Now that 4.5 will allow more light to come in and give you more of a blurrier background and be able to deal with uh, harsher lighting conditions. However, you're at 150 millimeters instead of all the way extended to 600. There's a sweet spot actually for every single lens and every single aperture. Generally speaking, you don't always want to shoot at the maximum aperture, say 6.3. If you have a 500 f4 lens, a prime lens, you generally don't always, always want to shoot at that uh, lowest aperture number. Every single lens has a sweet spot and most of the time it is around f8 to f11. Now I do understand the argument of the faster the aperture and you're shooting at uh, say f2.8 or f4, yeah you're gonna get that more blurred out background and you're gonna have your subject pop out. However, there's ways around that that we'll get into in a second as well. If say you have a slower uh, lens, say f6.3, f7.1, or f11, you can still get that exact same look and have your subject pop out, stand out, and have the background blurred out. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But if you're looking to get the sharpest image possible, the most cleanest image possible, you're generally wanting to stop down at least one or two stops. Now, some cameras will have animal eye detect uh, in the inside the camera settings itself. Um, if your camera does have that feature, um, you should utilize that and it's going to be just be able to track that animal, track that bird, and track the eye of that bird a heck of a lot easier. Bees flying all the way around me. Stay away from me, bee, stay away. Jump in here really quick, guys, and show you the most important piece of gear ever for nature and wildlife photographers that you never want to leave home without. And it's not your camera. And it's not your lens. It is not your camera bag. It is a thermos. <laughs> Don't leave home without this, guys. I'm telling you, hot, 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 hot weather. You can have ice cold beverage or in the extreme cold conditions, a hot cup of joe right inside this sucker. Do not leave home without some type of thermos of some type. Good old large mouth. It's my favorite fish. Inside of your settings, you want to look for servo mode. Now what that's going to do is it's going to continuously autofocus on the subject. So if something else comes in between in the foreground or whatever, it's going to continuously track what you initially set the autofocus point on. Now the next setting that goes hand in hand with that is high speed continuous. Uh, look for the big H um, inside your settings and it'll have multiple frames that are connected to the H. Basically all that means is uh, the whole, when you hold down the shutter button, it's going to take multiple shots. Generally you want a camera that shoots upwards of 10, 15, or 20 frames per second. When you hold down the button, it's automatic. Think of it as a machine gun. Okay, I, I don't recommend shooting your camera like that, but you, you, you get what I mean. You get what I mean. I'm having flashbacks of my army days. Now, when it comes to your lens, guys, this is the most important piece of gear, in my opinion, over the camera body. Let me explain what I'm talking about. So when, when you're looking for the type of lens that you want, you generally want to first identify what kind of subject you want to shoot. If you're more or less just a backyard type photographer, a kit lens that generally comes in a, a cheaper camera kit, um, say a 70 to 300 or a 75 to 300, would work fine for, for your backyard, backyard photography or the zoo, taking it to the zoo. 75 to 300 would be perfect. But if you're more or less trying to shoot like out here, along the back country and you want to try to get wildlife that are in their natural habitat, I would recommend a lens no less than 400 millimeters. And 500 to 600 millimeters is even better. In my opinion, an all around good, affordable wildlife lens for beginners is without a doubt a Sigma 150 to 600 or a Tamron 150 to 600, or another zoom lens that's the equivalent of 100 to 500 or 200 to 600, that's generally a great starting point. I mean, you don't wanna come up on a warbler or a duck with like 300 millimeters. They're gonna laugh at your size. <laughs> at least they 
laugh at me anyways. And we can go back and forth with this whole debate of megapixels. Uh, guys, you know, unless you're printing huge, huge work, anything over 24 megapixels is excellent. It's gonna do an excellent, excellent job. There are cameras out there now that go up to 45 megapixels. Even newer ones are coming out upwards of 100 megapixels. Those, are, those work really, really good and really well um, for cropping an image. Um, if, you're doing so, if you're somebody who heavily crops and you wanna uh, retain that detail, uh, yes, generally you wanna go with a higher megapixel camera. If you're not printing your work really, really large, especially only for social media, for YouTube, for Facebook, for Instagram, and the vast majority of photographers today are online photographers. And uh, honestly, you're never gonna really tell the difference too much between megapixel counts. You are somebody who does crop a lot and you're not somebody that wants to use um, extenders or teleconverters and you wanna crop more. Yeah, generally the higher megapixel will help with that because it'll retain and keep more of that detail. But yeah, guys, I wouldn't get too heavily debated on the megapixel game because honestly, even 24 megapixels isn't enough today to take phenomenal photos. And there's a lot of professionals that still use 24 megapixels, to be honest. You hear the swans? They're out in full force today. <laughs> I just heard the bald eagle chirp. Now you hear the whole thing with Hollywood, right? Where you hear the, the bald eagle screech. You know, that's actually not the bald eagle. That's actually a red-tailed hawk. The bald eagle actually makes a slight chirping noise. But the next topic is going to be on tripods, monopods, and hand holding. Each one has their benefits, each one has their pros and their cons. I'm gonna sit down and the bald eagle will just gracefully make its presence and uh, I won't have my camera ready. <laughs> Always happens that way. But the tripod, uh, the pros of that is that if you're gonna be somewhere stationary, if you're gonna be somewhere where you know that you're, you're traveling light, you know, not going too far, maybe in a hide and you're gonna be stationary inside a hide all day or for a few hours, or you're just going up to a location and you're just gonna be stationary there, um, a tripod works really, really well. Generally, if you're carrying a bigger lens, a heavier lens, or a big prime lens, or even something, you know, typically even with a, a Sigma 150 to 600, you generally want a decent sized ball head and a really good sized uh, tripod that'll be able to handle the weight uh, because sometimes these can get up to, you know, 10 pounds just for the lens itself. I know that sounds crazy, uh, but there are a lot of the um, lenses can get up towards up to 10 pounds. So you want a sturdier tripod. Now the downside to that though is they can get heavy, like really, really heavy, especially on long hikes, on long trips. And uh, yeah, if you're already carrying a backpack full of gear, you're carrying, you know, your water, um, and then, uh, you know, you're carrying the tripod with the camera, uh, with the lens, generally speaking, all that together, and you're carrying it over your shoulder, it still weighs you down really quick. And I really just think that if you're going down the route of having a tripod, it's really beneficial for situations where you're just gonna be stationary and you're not hiking very far. Now, if you're somebody that does video along with your photography, yes, the tripod is going to be the better solution because you can ha attach a video fluid head to the tripod and you're gonna get smooth video out of that. The monopod is similar to a tripod and hand holding, it's somewhere in between. It's basically instead of three legs like a tripod, it just has the one extending one leg. A Little bit more trickier because you can't just let go of the monopod like you can a tripod, um, but it is extremely lighter than a tripod. It's more mobile uh, than a tripod is. It can get into tighter places that generally a tripod won't be able to. And the next one is hand holding. This one is the most versatile way of doing nature and wildlife photography. It's the most lightest way of doing nature and wildlife photography. When the action is getting super quick, you can just pull your camera up and shoot and move. And it's just so versatile to go handheld and uh, so freeing too, because uh, you're not limited to your mobility like you are with a tripod or a monopod. Now the downside to handholding is you have the potential of having more camera shake. Now me personally, I am trying to keep my kit lighter and lighter, smaller and smaller as I go out on my hikes. But there are situations that definitely call for the tripod or monopod. So the next piece of gear you want to invest in is a pair of binoculars or a monocular will work excellent too. It's just good to have them because you can scope out an area without having to lug around all your gear. You can just down your gear and just pull out your binoculars, keep them around your neck or having your, monoc your one monocular inside your pocket, very portable. 
and uh, you're just able to scout locations that you generally wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye or even so much your zoom on your camera lens. It's just more versatile, more easier to just scope out wildlife. Oh, the dreaded camera bag. That is next. <laughs> I've been through so many camera bags, guys, uh, that some of them aren't even camera bags. And I just, it's a love-hate relationship with these things. But overall, really quick, get something that's gonna be comfortable. Get something that has really good ergonomics for you and, and your back and your hips. Something that's gonna fit you extremely well. Generally, I find it that camera bags, bags are actually designed for camera gear. In my opinion, uh, aren't the greatest for hiking. So what I do is, um, what I've reverted back to is utilizing this hiking bag. This is by Osprey. A lot of different other types of hiking bags uh, for backpacking that you can get on the market. And uh, I found just utilizing this along with a camera insert because the camera backpacks, the ones that are designed for uh, camera gear, are not necessarily really good for all the other stuff you want to bring out to the field, like food, water, uh, maybe a, a, a shelter, uh, a sleeping bag, if you're doing an overnighter, um, you know, uh, rain gear when the weather turns nasty. All the other pieces of gear that you're going to be for the, for, the, for the outdoors, for hiking, that you're going to need for these trips. Now, F-Stop and a couple other camera backpack brands are starting to accommodate for those things, but you're going to be spending upwards of four or $500 for one of those bags. <laughs> you get, get yourself a good, solid, um, you know, even hiking bag I would recommend and just utilizing a camera insert. They'll basically do the same thing and they'll just last forever, guys, honestly. Man, it's getting pretty wicked out here, hopefully soon. That'd be pretty cool to have it start raining and cooling off. Next topic is going to be technique. Definitely study your subject. Um, study, study their behavior. Um, keep going back to the same location over and over and over again to get a general idea of how that type of species, how that bird, how it reacts uh, to different types of weather patterns or uh, how it eats and what, what's its diet and uh, just the different types of behavior that that wildlife has. Take for instance ducks, my favorite subject to shoot. <laughs> they like to fly into the wind and then also like when they're getting ready to do that um, awesome like flapping, bleh, I almost feel bad. <laughs> flapping their wings or they'll bob their heads up and down as they're getting ready to go after their mate and then as they come up over the water that's when they'll do their spreading of their wings to capture that shot so my next tip is to get eye level get down low get on your belly lay down flat on the ground on the dirt in the mud in the grass wherever you're at in the snow and be okay with being miserable for a short period of time because it gives it a different perspective. And doing this goes back to what I was talking about, about having a really expensive low f-stop uh, lens with your aperture. And you wanna get that exact same look of blowing out that background, letting the subject, letting that bird pop out and uh, have that separation. What gives the blurred out background isn't necessarily has much to do with the lens itself. It's more or less the distance that you are from that bird and then the distance from that background is to the bird. So the further the background is, the further the animal is away from the background, the trees or whatever is behind it, or the closer that you are um, to that subject, the more it's going to give that blurry background. You can get the same type of look with a cheap $1,000 lens that you can with a expensive $10,000 lens. Now getting low is also going to uh, give it more of an intimate feel with the subject, like you're right there next to it. Or if you just can't get access to the bank itself, uh, get yourself a cheap pair of waders um, or get on a boat. Um, that will also give you phenomenal shots. Just be very, very careful if you're out there in waders with your gear. Not that I know somebody that has actually dropped their camera gear <laughs> in the water before while wearing waders. Check those cloud formations out. Yeah, it's definitely going to be storming over here in just a few. Can't wait. Absolutely love being out here in storms. So the next thing I think that is important for somebody just getting started in this hobby is when you're taking your photograph of your subject, of your bird or, or the animal, try to, ha if you're going for less of a portrait shot, and there's nothing wrong with portrait shots, don't get me wrong, where you're filling the frame entirely with just the, 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 the head or, or just a full body shot, 
nothing wrong with those. Those are absolutely fine and great. It's good to experiment with more environmental shots too. And I think that if you're going to add more of the environment and more of the landscape with the, uh, the wildlife, uh, try to capture your wildlife in such a way that to where it's flying into dead space. What I mean by that is um, having the face or the, or the head of the animal or the wildlife, if it's flying or if it's moving or if it's looking, um, have it have the dead space facing as, as it, wherever it's looking towards. Because if it's the dead space is behind the animal instead of in front of the animal, it just has nowhere to go. It has nowhere for the eyes to kind of go or give the illusion of it, the animal is going somewhere. Or if you have the composition to where the wildlife is looking towards all the dead space, it's actually going somewhere as a purpose. And everything doesn't always have to be a portrait shot. Also, I know this is kind of counterintuitive to what I was saying about using a blind or used utilizing a tripod um, and being stationary and staying in one location for a while. That is good and it has its purpose but also don't stay in a location too long. Oftentimes that we miss a lot of opportunities just because the general consensus is to stay in one location and let the wildlife come to you. While that is true and that holds a lot of weight, um, I do think that we miss a lot of opportunities because we just stay in one location and we don't explore. So when it comes to editing your photographs, when it comes to post-processing, when it comes to picking and choosing an editing software, uh, that would fit your needs and your purpose. Now to put it short, here is how I feel about editing your photos. Pick an editing software, be it Lightroom, Photoshop, um, and whatever case may be, and just dig into the analytics of it and find out how to utilize it and its art. Photography is art and it's art is subjective. So however you wanna, sh however you wanna edit your photos, do it for you first. People back in the day thought you know, utilizing a dark room was cheating, you know what I mean? How ridiculous is that? Play around, have fun. And uh, however, however editing looks to you, however you want to make that photograph feel, it's definitely not the time to be putting other photographers down because of the way they edit. Some choose to not edit at all, which is fine, and then some choose to edit very, very light to where they try to replicate what they saw out in the field. And then there's the other uh, extreme to where people are like, you know what, I want to make this more abstract. I want to make it more look like art um, and uh, just uh, change that perspective. There's nothing wrong with that either. And then there's individuals, photographers who are somewhere in the middle. Just enjoy the process. Enjoy the process of editing your photography. Oh, it's starting to come down and starting to rain. Uh, definitely visit your local duck ponds. I think those are so valuable to brand new photographers and then even advanced photographers who just missed the opportunity to just go to your local duck pond and shoot your local wildlife. You know what I mean? Just stuff that's right in your own backyard. Uh, great for learning and honing your craft and honing your skills. Oh, that rain is cold. <laughs> oh my gosh. More memory cards. Bring more memory cards. Don't forget your memory cards. Don't forget batteries, guys, like I said, because there'll be multiple times I'm out and I'm getting, I'm getting ready to get a good shot and bam, starts blinking. Two or three more batteries than what you think you might need, as well as one or two extra memory cards as well. Inside a waterproof, I say waterproof, <laughs> waterproof uh, container inside of your camera bag as well. Also, <laughs> bring rain jackets. Because you never know, right? So when it comes to ethics, I more or less stand on the side of just be respectful, uh, you know, know when to step away and not get too close. You generally want to take things slow, slow movements. You want to be more quiet. You don't always have to wear camo. Um, yes, there are certain situations where camo might be beneficial, either a ghillie suit or just a camo top. If you're just wearing darker colors like greens, dark greens, you know, bl uh, blacks, browns, uh, dark reds, uh, you know, stuff like that, maroon, uh, dark grays. It's, uh, it's the movement that the wildlife see first. It's not necessarily the color, it's the movement. Ah, uh, the glorious downside of wearing glasses out in the rain. Either they get rained on and wet, or it's foggy. <laughs> uh, so flushing is a term used when you get too close to the wildlife and you basically run it off, you scare it off, you flush it. And uh, that's something that we all, as photographers, we wanna to try to avoid is getting too close, too quick, 
to where it just it flushes and it pushes out that wildlife, that subject. We got too close, we scared it, we were too loud. Also get involved in conservation groups like YouTube groups, Facebook groups, um, other types of wildlife photography groups to where you can learn about the habitats and learn about the different species. Plethora of information out there uh, that are right that is right at our fingertips that we ought to utilize. But don't be afraid to also get connected with other like-minded photographers that are in your area, in your local areas. Um, so if you're, you're on a trail, you're going hiking, you're going for a trip, and you pass by somebody else with a camera, you're passing by another local photographer, don't be afraid to, stay, to say hi. Don't be afraid to stop and get connected on that level because there's so much to learn and, and there's so much to learn from each other. And this is one big community of like-minded individuals that love this hobby. And guys, my very last tip when it comes to wildlife photography for somebody who's just getting started and picking up a camera for the very first time is really something that I'm incorporating into a brand new book that I am recently writing. And that is to just not stop chasing after that joy that is in this hobby. Don't let that fire burn out. It's so easy, easy to let that joy go out. That joy doesn't stop when you get back into your car after the field. That joy goes beyond that to when you're at home editing those photographs and, and including printing. Yes, print your work. Hold something tangible that you created. You know what I mean? Something that you could hold, frame, put on the wall, admire and look and be inspired by every time you go out with your cameras. Do not play the comparison game, guys. It is so easy to fall into that. I've done this multiple, multiple times where I've gotten it in my head that my photography, my artwork, my photographs are just not good enough. Like they're not, compared to the next person's that you just flip on Instagram and you just see like, oh my gosh, that is so beautiful, that's amazing. And then you, what do you do? We go, we go to our, our, our portfolios and we compare them. And I'm here to tell you guys, that is a dangerous game. That is an endless pursuit of something that's the opposite of joy. In fact, that will steal your joy of doing this hobby. Guys, I'm gonna wrap this video up. I hope that it was informative. I'm hoping that uh, somebody uh, got something out of it and was able to take away a little bit of information. Uh, maybe somebody who just got started into photography, maybe you haven't picked up a camera yet and uh, you're looking for that motivation uh, and that encouragement uh, to get out there and get a camera, get your hands on a camera and get out there and enjoy nature because ultimately, ultimately, that is what it's all about, is the experience. Getting out here, breathing in the air, being around the wildlife, experiencing nature, being one with nature for a brief moment. All of our cares, all of our worries, all of our struggles are gone for a moment. That is what this is all about. If you're not yet subscribed and you don't want to miss future videos on the great outdoors and nature and wildlife photography, hit the subscribe button and also give it a like if you enjoyed it. It does help out the channel. Like always guys, get out into nature, enjoy the opportunity that is in front of you with your cameras. There's no such thing as a bad photograph only a missed opportunity. Take care guys, God bless, and I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye.